Podcasting worldwide from Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, Canada. Welcome back to the Personal Process Podcast. The show that takes you through the growth, hardship, self-discovery, lessons, and stories of individuals who achieved success in their own personal path. Trust the process. Welcome back to the Personal Process Podcast. Today's guest, Brian Hildebrand. Who is Brian? Great question. Well, Brian has served at New York City during 9-11, and he has a long career working in paramedicine. His story is one that is going to be very exciting, and Brian has a very special message that I believe is really important. So without further ado, Brian, how are you doing today, sir? Doing very well. Thank you for having me as a guest. Yeah, for sure. So, Brian, do you mind just giving us a little background about yourself? Like, where were you raised? Where were you born? You know? Uh, my, my parents had the wanderlust grown up. Uh, I moved everywhere. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. I, I settled in New York city when I was, um, 17. Yeah. Uh, before that, California, Florida, Texas, New Mexico, Arkansas, everywhere. You didn't go to Alaska though, did you? No, that's one. I, okay. I went to Oregon. <laughs> Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Close, close, but no cigar on that oh, one. Yeah, that, yeah. That's awesome, Brian. So, you know, you, you moved around a lot and, I mean, I haven't moved to nearly as many states as you, but I moved around, you know, schools and stuff. What do you think that experience was like for you? Uh, when, when I was younger, I resented it. Yeah? Um, In what way? Because you're always changing things, like a new school, new friends, and you have to start the process all over again every time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's rough as a kid. Yeah. But then as, as I grew up as an adult into my 20s, and I, and I realized I have experiences no one else does. I, I, I have understanding that it, it takes that kind of lifestyle to really understand. Do you mind going a little uh, bit further into that? Yeah. Because um, you see the differences and the uniformity across a wide, wide area. Mm -hmm. You see how the people are similar. You see how env environments are similar. Um, personalities. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you're forced to make friends over and over and over again, you, you kind of, it pushes into you into knowing yourself because mm -hmm. you're getting the same friends over and over again. Why, why are you getting the same friends over and over again? <laughs> so you, you start looking inside and going, Oh, okay. I know where that comes from. It's, it's safer to be that with that kind of friend versus these others. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that was my experience with, with moving. I'm grateful. I'm yeah. grateful. No, that's fantastic. And Brian, and I'm going to, I'm trying to go deep. So feel free to just push me along if you don't want to. No worries, no worries. But, um, you know, there's a very unique experience moving around so much and literally from right to left, we're only missing Alaska, but I mean, that's, you got to pass Canada to go through that. So that's all good. You've pretty much been everywhere in the States. So, you know, Brian, like what was the one moment? And again, if this is, if this is live and, uh, you know, no pressure at all, but what was the one moment where you, just realize that. Like, do you have any stories to tell about that or? Uh, let's see. Big question. I, I stories from every place that I've lived, literally. Yeah. Um, cause, cause my, my parents like nature. Um, yeah. And so, so for instance, uh, New Mexico with the, the, the hot springs. Yeah. Uh, I, I grew up going to hot springs in, in, <laughs> in the winter with snow outside, you roll in the, the, the snow and then you jump back into the hot spring. Yeah. Um, beauty i grew up in uh the florida down by the everglades yeah going to alligators and fishing and and, and frogging yeah. And, and, yeah um uh the california venice beach beauty Growing up, I, I, I was very young when i was there but i remember it trust me i remember it yeah um what an experience to to, to be able to go out there and see the the intermingling of people and i have all those experiences when most people just have the Everglades, just have Venice yeah. Beach, just so, yeah. Yeah, so Brian, when you, you mentioned all these experiences, um, what benefit do you think it gave you in addition to seeing the uniformity in people and in addition to, you know, realizing that, you know, maybe you have a comfort zone with certain group of people? Um, 
how is it, do you think, affected your ability to communicate with people, especially, you know, as a paramedic where you have to make an intimate connection in half a second like that? Interesting question. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it gave me strength and confidence. Yeah. Be, be, because you're, you're so unsure of everything mm -hmm. for so long because it changes year to year, new school, new school, new friends, new place, yeah. new teachers, that after a while, it's no big deal. Yeah. And it's just another part of life. And then you go to appreciate the experiences that you have and the people that you meet. And mm -hmm. that segued right into my career. Yeah. It, it gave me the strength to, oh, ambulance driver, what's that? EMT, <laughs> I, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, that was when I was 18. I was 18. At school when I was 18, yeah. So, okay, you appreciated, you know, just meeting people and making that connection with people. Mm -hmm. And you went into paramedicine at 18. So how was that like? You know, like, were you ever unsure of it? Did you just like go into, I, yeah. It was accidental. Accidental? <laughs> Tell me about it. Into it totally by accident. Yeah. Um, I knew I was going to go into medicine. My, my mother was in medicine. My family has been in medicine right. since World War II. Right. Um, and I went for, an EMT, for a, 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 a CPR class. Yep. And they had this pamphlet on the desk that said, become an EMT. And I was getting ready for nursing school and all this stuff. Right. I just graduated from high school. And right. uh, EMT, emergency. Oh, an ambulance truck. Oh, well, 12 bucks an hour. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went to EMT school. It was very quick. It was, it was like a, a semester class, a one semester okay. class. Um, I, I got my state licensure. Yeah. Uh, and then I began working. Yeah. And uh, Brian, I think you had an interesting story before, you know, you actually began working and you were in that paramedical school. Hmm. With the whole New York City, with the... Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, there, there's a difference between EMT and paramedic. An mm -hmm. EMT is a, a lower level of training and skill right. and, and knowledge. Right. Uh, paramedic is an extra year or two of, of college level classes and, and training. Um, so I was an EMT for about six or seven years before I went to, to paramedic school. Okay. My bad about that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I started in, um, January 2001, okay. I started paramedic school. Uh, I was very excited uh, because I had just recently, like two months previously, had this job that that affected me. Um, oh, I was working in Manhattan. Uh, I was on the Lower East Side. We called the the Alphabet City. Alphabet City. Yeah, we it's so over on Avenue D. We got a cardiac rest in the projects down that they have down there. Um, they're tall story buildings. Right. So this was up on the 20th floor. Wow. Um, get in the elevator. We're going up to the 20th floor. Door opens up. This tiny little cop, she, she must have been like 120 pounds soaking wet, grabs me by my, my, my shirt and goes, come here. And uh, she says, you have to do CPR. And the, I see the firefighter coming toward me doing CPR on this little three-month-old. And, I'm, oh, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, so he, he, he just kind of, oh, here you go. Here's the kid. Do something. Yeah. And so, so I started CPR. We go down the 20 floors. The paramedics were downstairs. Um, elevator opens. The paramedics there. I did the same thing. I went, uh, do something. <laughs> and he did this. He did just what I was doing. And no other advanced care. So that, mm -hmm. that made me want to go to paramedic school and do better. Two yeah. months later, I was in paramedic school. That's fantastic. Yeah. That, that, that's why I went into medic school. That's, in, that's and, incredible. And with my graduation, mm, tell me it, about it, that. It, it's a year of hell. It, any <laughs> paramedic that you talk to will tell you that if they had to work for a living mm -hmm. during medic school, it, it was a year of hell. Uh, so we, we got through most of the class and we're, we're headed towards like the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm working uh, over the overnights. I, I worked 12 to 8 as, as an EMT at the time. Wow. Uh, me and my partner are coming home. Uh, we get off at 8 o'clock. In the morning. And, uh, wow. Tuesday, 9-11, we hear uh, the, about this plane crash. Mm -hmm. into the World Trade Center. And we're like, hmm. 
So I go home, I turn on the TV. Yep. Uh, and, and I see the plane crash and I'm thinking, uh, I, I don't remember when it was 42 or the, the plane crash that hit the, uh, the Empire State Building back in yeah. the, so I'm Change thinking, world. okay, accidental. No, no, it happened again. Yeah. Uh, another plane hit. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I started panicking because my wife at the time was working in Manhattan. Yeah. On the same block as those buildings. Right. Um, wow. My son was in school and I was supposed to come home and go to sleep because I just finished working. Yeah. Um, it, it was two hours of, of, of worry and, and concern and, and phone right. calls and all the lines were dead because you had how million many? people. Seven million people in the, in the city. Everyone uses using their, their phones. Um, she came home. My son got home, thank God, after uh, about an hour and a half, two hours. And, and I told them both, I'm sorry, I, I, I got to go. Yeah. And wow. that was my response to 9-11. So uh, there for four days. Wow. Okay. So this is a very, I'm going to dive into this very deeply because I'm super interested. You have, mm -hmm. you know, a first person view of everything that was going on. But before we even dive in, you know, like just your ability to tell your family, like right after they're safe, like I got to go, like, did you even have to think about it or was it just like instinctual? It, it was in instinctual because I was attracted to the job that was right for me and mm -hmm. also that, that people needed from me. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a calling. Right. Uh, I, I feel in this day and age, a lot of people that go into the medical field, it's about the money and about, oh yeah, hey, I can do this and do that. For me, it was a calling. Right. Um, right. So that, that helped me respond because I, I knew I could make a, a change in someone's life, that I could have a positive ass effect on someone's life. That's fantastic, Brian. And yeah, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people don't even realize about a career. They just go in for money, but then they're like, oh, you know, I'm burnt out. I don't like what I'm doing. And the rest of their life is a little bit sad. And I think that's a very interesting point that you made. I, um, I could have been a millionaire. I, I chose not to. I like my life. I, I yep. like paramedic. I've made money out of it. I've gotten yep. it to the point where it's lucrative, but yep. I mean, it, it was worth the sacrifice. It Absolutely. was. Absolutely. So Brian, you know, like we were talking about, you know, the initiative you have for paramedicine. We're talking about, you know, just the instinctual. I can't. So again, ladies and gentlemen, Brian just finished his shift comes back home for, at 8 a.m. and 9-11 happens. Second plane crash and Brian is rushing out, you know, his family is safe and he's like, okay, that's done, next step, let's go. You know, I can't even imagine how you can do that after an eight hour shift overnight, but let's, let's go through that day, like as much detail as you can, as you're comfortable with, obviously. And uh, just tell me I'm, about that. I'm comfortable, it's, it's what, 19 years now? Yeah. Um, it took me a while to get over, yeah. uh, to be able to process it and, and deal with the, the, the grief and, and the tragedy. Absolutely. But now I'm ready to share. Yeah. Um, Tell me. So um, I borrowed my, uh, my partner's old Thunderbird jalopy. Uh, this thing was a boat. It was yeah. huge. Uh, <laughs> I took the muffler was off and it went putt, putt, putt. But I, I drove um, from my house where I was across Staten Island where I live yep. to um, a staging area. Yeah. Because uh, they were looking to see who's going to Manhattan, who's going there, who's covering uh, 911 for the city, who's doing uh, transports to get people out. And I ended up uh, going to Staten Island Ferry on the Staten Island side. Wow. Um, and I was forward triage. I got assigned forward triage. Uh, as you I might. mentioned, Sorry, Brian, do you mind just uh, explaining a little bit of forward sure. triage? For, forward triage is they were just finally allowing people back over the ferry because they had sent everyone north yep. uh, across the bridges. So they were just allowing them to come back to Staten Island. And people were hurt. Yeah. People were devastated. People had seen things. Uh, they had injuries. So as they were coming off the ferry, the forward triage would say, hey, you look hurt. Go over there and go get seen by this person. Hey, right. how you doing? Are you okay? Do you need someone to talk to? And yeah. that was my, my job for a number of hours as people were 
we're coming over. Yeah. So you're, you're just talking with people who just experienced, I, I think that 9-11 is still one of the most traumatic experiences for a lot of individuals and it really changed the world. I mean, I think that was the event that really, you know, took airport security to a new level and, you know, it, it's just, you, you say 9-11, there isn't one person who doesn't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, so you were dealing with the people that were going through, you know, X, Y, Z from mental problems to physical problems. Like, what's going on in your head? Like, are you even thinking at this point or, you know? No, be, be, because part of, part of a, an EMT's training is, is mm -hmm. react. Don't think, yeah. react. Right. And the reaction is to go towards danger. <laughs> so um, we were all still in reaction mode. Like we we're looking across the water and you can see the, the twin towers burning. Where, yeah. And it was, oh my God, we got to do as much as possible. Yeah. And then as people came over, the, the, it started going into dribs and drabs and then no one came over. Right. Uh, so I, I was there from, I'd say... 11 to, to 5 p.m. Wow. Wow. And, and, and towards the end, like I said, no one was coming across. And so what were you thinking? I, I, was, I was actually hoping that people were, were safe because yeah. I, I was hoping that the lower Manhattan was empty because yeah. it needed to be empty at that point. Yeah. Um, I still wasn't really processing what was happening. A lot of rumors going around. What were you hearing um, on the ground? Oh my God. Um, uh, oh, over flights, terrorists. Yeah. Um, all the cabs were missing. Uh, what? The stupid stuff. Like, uh, so the cabs missing thing was uh, that the cabs had uh, all been notified because they're, they're of a, a certain uh, color. And uh, they, so they were oh, missing man. from lower Manhattan during 9-11 which was BS because three or four days later, I got assigned to Great Kills uh, Landfill. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That's where they were dumping all the, uh, the stuff from Manhattan. Plenty of cabs there. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, Man. Yeah, and that's the one thing, right? Because just in times of tragedy, it's not even about the physical that's happening. It's a mental, it's the hysteria, it's the rumors and it's the first responders that really have to just keep it together, not only for themselves, but for everyone else. Like, you know, I can't even imagine, you know, you just finished uh, 12 to eight overnight and you're coming from 11 to five, like responding with a hundred percent of your focus. And, you know, you're trying to deal with everything. Do you have any, like any memorable moments during this first day um, whether it's with a patient, whether it's with, uh, you know, anything that you want to take away from that. So many, many, many memories that day. Um, I'd say one of the big ones is the very first glimpse that I got of the Twin Towers over New York Harbor from Staten Island into mm -hmm. Manhattan and, and seeing the, uh, the, 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 the flames, not the flames, but the smoke going up and that made it real for me. Because because when I was driving over there, I I, I could kind of see s smoke and stuff, but when I saw the buildings in Manhattan, Manhattan, I was like, wow, wow, yeah, we we were just stunned. Yeah, and yeah, I I uh, I am honestly not even sure if I even remember it properly since I was very very young at the time. I was still in grade school, and you know. Um, even then, I still have like a visceral feeling about that. I think, or we had, we went to a gymnasium and we put it on a projector. And it's crazy, you know, just mm -hmm. one event. It's so ingrained into your brain, and I I can't imagine what it's like to actually have been there to see, you know, your own place of residence just go into something like that. And yeah, so you know, Brian, we're talking about the getting there we're talking about you helping what happened next so when when people started coming in dribs and drabs i i felt useless how so um, we had no patience wow we had no one to care for so we responded but there was nothing to do right um i later learned from compatriots that worked in the city they felt the same way 
really responded to the to the pile to to the hole and they felt the same way no patience there's that, that was? rush of of let's get him to the hospital but after that you're either dead or you're home yeah so at that point i was like okay uh this is gonna be a long few weeks right let me get, let me get home uh and i took the train home i lay down for for about two, eh, an hour and a half couldn't sleep yeah at all because all. because just my memories my thoughts the things i'd seen you're just starting um, to process it yeah so I, I ended up uh, getting up at like 8.30 or 9. I grabbed something to eat. I, I ended the same thing. I told my wife and son, okay, I'm going. And I, and I left again. Um, wow. I ended up getting into the city around 10.30 p.m. that Tuesday, 9-11. 10.30 or 11, something like that. Right. Um, from there, I went up to my uh, one of my full-time jobs that I had uh on the lower east side yeah uh, at the time it was a company called metro care uh they, they no longer care. exist <laughs> but um i ended up riding on the paramedic ambulance i, right. I was an EMT at the time but we all got upgraded they, they upgraded all of us oh you're you're in medic school oh you're almost done okay you're a medic so i ended up riding up on the uh the medic ambulance that night and right. we did nothing nothing there's wow. nothing to do no one called no one uh, needed help, and the the radios were silent. For for the for the the line units, mm -hmm. the radios were silent. Silent. Yeah, and at this time, like you were mentioning, you know, the people that have got out are probably just at home, just shocked and stunned, and you know, the people who unfortunately weren't able to pass through this time were. Gone. This was a, a worldwide event. It, it didn't just yeah. affect New York City. It didn't just affect the Northeast. I mean, people in Thailand and Germany and yeah. this affected everywhere. Yeah. Um, I, I saw one of the um, the monuments that that Russia gave to the United States for 9/11. It's actually very poignant. It, it's a giant teardrop. It's a giant metal teardrop. Right. And I love it. And yeah. this came from Russia in 2001. So this was a worldwide event. Yeah. And, and that's a very interesting uh, piece because I'm a, I'm a little bit into poetry as well, um, Brian. And, you know, it's kind of like everyone's tears go into a collective one. So it's one topic, but everyone cries the same. And we all make one thing together. And going on on that metaphorical basis, you know, how did the community feel after, like, obviously devastated no question about that but in terms of connection to one another like did you sense anything different uh one of the things that we learned in, in paramedic school is the 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 five stages of grief yeah uh, so the first one's denial everyone was denying it the first day no yeah. no no no. it's this it's that the, the rumors going around yeah yeah and, and then you go into, what is it, uh, denial, uh, uh, depression. Mm -hmm. uh, so everyone, the entire city was going through those stages. Yeah. So, so by the, the second day, the Wednesday, uh, yeah. the, the 12th, they, they were starting to get angry. Right. They, they were starting to want to lash out, but they were still fearful because they're, they're dealing with loved ones missing. And yeah. you started seeing all the um, uh, the notices go up in the hospitals or at churches saying, have you seen this person? Here's a picture. Contact here. Yeah. And yeah. Wow. The, the facing that, difficult. Difficult. And how do you direct that when, when it's kind of your job to protect society medically? out on the field, uh, out on the streets. How do you direct that? Because that's what we do. We, we direct society medically. Cops direct society security-wise. Yeah. Uh, firefighters direct society with, with their safety. Yeah. So I haven't felt that until COVID. Yeah. COVID was the next time I felt that feeling. Yeah. And, you know, I want to stay on this topic a little bit longer. You just have so much experience. Um, 
But, uh, you know, like, that's just incredible. And, you know, you're saying that patients weren't coming in and you had to direct people where you had no direction yourself and no one really knew what to do at that time. Right. You know, like, yeah, I don't even know what questions to ask, uh, Brian, but I guess you, you lead the way transition as you feel as fits and we'll keep going. Uh, so I'll, I'll just briefly go over uh, my next few days with 9-11. Um, so, so the next morning I got off of work of doing nothing. Yep. Uh, and I was like, I have to do something. So I, I went down to the pit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hitched a ride with uh, some cops that were going responding from Queens or something like that. Yeah, uh, and I got down there, and we got assigned, and we did nothing. It, it was it was searching. It yeah. was all the hard, heavy duty stuff was done by the uh, the professionals, the the ones that could climb into the wreckage and, and look for people yeah. and the dogs and us. We kind of hanged around the the perimeter, doing as best we could, helping people as best. But again, no one was there, so yeah. there there wasn't. There was no patience, so we, we again we felt useless. Um, coming back from that uh, that day on the ferry, I felt very despondent because all my training was for nothing. It, it almost felt yeah. like. Um, got back to Staten Island. I actually slept for six hours. Six uh, hours. Yeah. yeah, I got six hours sleep. Uh, I think in a four or five day period. Uh, the next day, I, I ended up going to the, the Great Kills Landfill, which is one yep. of the largest dumps in the world. Yep. Uh, and they were starting to bring all the um, rubble and stuff over from, from the, 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 yep. the area. Yep. And they were having detectives look for body parts because they, they started realizing, oh, we have to do the DNA testing, so they have to collect. And again, I felt useless, so I started collecting body parts. Uh, I, right. I followed the, the, the seagulls around looking to see what they were eating and Hey, get away from that scalp, get away from that finger. Yeah. And, and I'd put it in the bucket and Jeez. keep going. Wow. Um, after that, it settled into a routine because, again, I, I worked lower Manhattan, EMS. Yeah. Um, I upgraded in, uh, in December of 2001. I became a paramedic. And I worked there for another four years. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, it was a very large job for, for me, very large job. Um, went to the first uh, anniversary, the readings. Yeah. Um, went to the 10th anniversary and that's where I finally was able to let go and let go of all the, the grief and things I've been holding on with yeah. that. Um, but in the meantime, I was working, I experienced everywhere. I mean, I've worked in Westchester, yeah. uh, in the Bronx, uh, Manhattan, Queens, mm -hmm. uh, New Jersey. Yeah. So I, I, I spread myself out quite a bit. Uh, I started teaching about five or six years ago. Right. Um, and I think I kind of found my calling because that's, that's always what I've done in, in paramedicine. I teach. I, I teach people, look, if, if you do this, you won't get sick. Yeah. If you do this, you don't have to go to the hospital and, and sit there for four hours. Um, I, I enjoy what I do very much. So I'm, I'm teaching paramedics and in EMTs, yep. I'm teaching doctors and nurses with the, the AHA, American Heart Association. Yeah. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. So you're, you're doing the teaching and, you know, what was different about it compared to actually going up on the front lines for you? Big question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, what was I know I'm still doing it, but the, the most difficult yeah. part was finding a way to translate my experiences into understanding. Because mm. an EMT or a paramedic or a nurse or a doctor has medical knowledge. Yeah. They don't have my experience when it comes to certain things. So if I can give you a really simple concept and you go, oh, I got it now. That yeah. was because a lot of people in medicine they don't get things. They yeah. don't understand concepts. They understand little ideas. They're, they're, yeah. they're specialty, their focus. But yeah. when it comes to the big picture, they I can narrow it. it down and really describe that well. Yeah. And I want to take a brief moment to pause here, Brian, just to connect some dots. So, you know, Brian, we're starting back from your childhood where you moved around. You know, you met so many different people 
and you didn't really have that stable group of friends where you could have comfort. And although you would meet the same kind of group of people, you had to always say, Hey, my name is Brian. Nice to meet you looking for friends because you know, I'm moving and it's hard. So let's be friends. I have a cool mustache and you know, we'll uh, keep it going on. Hey, there we go. And uh, you know, I had a similar experience where I moved to seven different schools prior to university and uh, you know, granted not different States and anything like that, but even this small experiences compared to years, you know, I have the ability to connect with people to share these experiences because you know, it's not too much about being worried of what they think about me because, you know, once you're in a new environment, you got to step up. Baby, confidence. Confidence, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just from this one experience and you're able to convey information to professionals who others wouldn't, you know, and I think this is an important thing to kind of put out there because, you know, and you don't have to necessarily even go to seven different schools or move states kind of go out of your comfort zone. If there's someone you want to talk to because they have a great mustache like Brian or, you know, for any other reason, just put yourself out there. Worst comes to worst, they don't acknowledge you and that's fine. You go on with your day, wish them the best and you got a little bit more confident because you did what you wanted to do. And you know, that's experience translates into better ability to convey information in a way that everyone is able to relate because you are, communicator you've seen different individuals in different environments and you've gone forward yeah sorry that was just the main point and i thought that was a very interesting connection i could make um so yeah brian you're making these connections for individuals and how were i guess what are some strategies that you could give our viewers if they want to make these same connections from you know a detail-oriented person into connecting it to the same picture. And again, this is on the spot and you know, no pressure I, at all. Um, the, the big focus nowadays or the key words are uh, thinking outside the box, yeah. if you will. Um, school doesn't teach that at all. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's adult education or kindergarten, it, it teaches a process. Yeah. Um, when it comes to paramedicine, you have to think outside the box. Mm-hmm. You have to understand one concept really, really well and another concept really, really well because when you put them together, they interact. Mm-hmm. And if you can be able to explain that con- those two concepts and the interaction to someone else, a light bulb goes on and they go, got it, got it. So, for example, cardiovascular system. Yeah. There's all these little details about it, alveoli, uh, Mm -hmm. bronchioles, all these words and things. That's what they try to force you to memorize. Yeah. Um, A a different system, same same thing. They're they're trying to force you to memorize the little fine points. But again, if you can memorize, if you can understand the entire system, all those little fine points just come naturally. So that's what I've tried to do with my classes is, is convey that that wider understanding, that wider knowledge. Because if you can understand something, you can control something. Absolutely. And we need more people that can understand and control. Because now, it's not a lot of people. When, when, when you look at professions, it doesn't matter what it is, engineering, custodial, medicine, you have the top 10%, they're the ones that actually are really pushing things along and getting yeah. things changing and adapting so you learn. Yep. And the other 90% just kind of float along and, you know, and absolutely, that, it's the same with my job. Absolutely. You got teachers that will push things along and you got teachers that will just kind of go along with the flow. Absolutely. And this is another amazing point that you brought up, uh, Brian, because I actually see it in the very same way that you do, you know, mm-hmm. just connecting the dots because ultimately whether you know about an alveoli, bronchial, bronchi, and you know, what does it mean if you don't understand that it goes from your, you know, trachea, down you know and goes into your alveolar sac the gases exchange you go through your bloodstream pick up different molecules waste nutrients xyz you know it's uh interesting because even in medicine there's so much focus on minute details whereas the connection i feel is often missed it's Mm -hmm. not nearly as focused upon you know and especially especially in uh, school you know not even university we're let's talk like primary secondary they do call that in the States, right? 
It's not just uh, uh, no, uh, elementary school, junior high and high school. Okay. There we go. We got that clarification on, um, you know, but even in these kind of situations, it's very detail oriented. It's, you know, in history class, they teach you about events, but they don't teach you about like what this taught us about the world. You know, history don't... repeats itself. That, that's the big lesson from history from social yeah. studies. And they don't teach that. They don't. And you know, it's two Columbus sailed the, uh, uh, who cares? <laughs> yeah. And you know, like I barely remember any history of it and, it's interesting because there's some uh, readings that I'm doing now where they connect the history, they give insights, they give connections between events. And you're like, wow, this one historical event has allowed me to change my life. And uh, the one example that I want to give is, you know, I forgot the individual's name, but he went and he proposed to, I believe it was the Spanish empress at the time to fund him for an expedition out to discover new land. And this individual came from a poor background, but he just had utmost belief in himself. And he, he did this with complete confidence, as you mentioned, Brian, and Ash, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, he got it done. So by using this one story as, you know, a foundational piece, I was mm -hmm. stuck in my memory. And this is how I think communication should be. This is how I think teaching should be, but yet so many people just gloss over it. I mean, I'm yeah. sure you have way more experience than me, Brian. So what are your, I guess, recommendations if there is a teacher listening to this, if there is a parent, if there is a friend that wants to be better at communicating and teaching different concepts or point of view, because we can use this in sales too, right? Absolutely. Um, hmm. Big question again. <laughs> it is. Uh, I'd say... You, you don't always have to know what you're teaching, mm. but you have to understand the concepts. If you can understand the concepts, yeah, you might be, have a curriculum that pushes little details. But again, if you understand the big picture, you teach the big picture first, and then all the little trickle down, all the little pieces will come together. So in the student's mind, later down the road, it's all one thing instead yeah. of two separate things. That's Absolutely. what I think for to be a good teacher. You got to do that. That's huge. That is definitely huge. Um, okay. So Brian, uh, I'm going to give you the power and the ability to traverse even further. So you take it as you see fit. You have a lot of cool experiences and I don't want to miss over anything. So we're at the point of, you know, you're gone to teaching, you are, you know, we're seeing right now your ability to teach is there and you are able to make those connections and you enjoy teaching, which is, I think, the most important part of it, because when you enjoy teaching, the people enjoy learning. So, so please take the, uh, you know, I forgot what the word is, but take control and go forward. Uh, I'm also still working. Uh, yeah. I have a full time job uh, working 911 overnights. Yep. Uh, I've been on the same unit for almost 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I recently lost my partner of 14 years. <laughs> he oh left me God. for another unit. Um, brutal. Brutal. Yeah. But, but that's all right. Yeah. You, you, you got to grow. You got to grow. For sure. Um, and, and because, because of my adapting uh, outlook and my changing outlook because of my experiences with teaching and whatnot, mm -hmm. my, my practice as a paramedic has, has also changed. How so? Um, initially, when you first become a paramedic, it's about what we call protocols. There, there's a list of uh, things that you follow in certain situations. Yep. Uh, and as you grow into it, you, you, the, you make the protocols part of you. And then as mm. you grow past that, you get an understanding beyond the protocols. Yeah. Guess what? There's a stage past that. Is there? Yes. The, the stage past that is, is not just making it a part of you, but expressing it outwardly. That's the teaching part. Mm. So when it comes to my practice as a paramedic, I don't do a lot of physical medicine much anymore. That's for aggressive. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do yeah. that. I gotta use these drugs. I have to do this procedure. Yeah. And nowadays I go, uh, so how's your home life? 
Yeah. Oh, you're, you're still de dealing with uh, the, the black mold from Hurricane Sandy four or five years ago? Yeah. Oh, okay. Where are you living? Okay. Yeah, I see. That's what I do. I, I try to, again, bigger picture. Huge. So if, if you can take a bigger picture in society and in, in your interactions, you affect change. And not, yeah. not, not a little change. You affect a major amount of change. So that's part of what I'm trying to get out there. That's part of the message I'm trying to push in, in my 911 job and in my teaching job, because if there's more doers out there, if there's no more people that understand the big picture, the world gets better. Yeah. That's that whole uh, do, don't just say. Yeah. I want people to do. Step up. Step up. But you got to be confident. Yep. You got to be willing to, you got to be curious and you got to be willing to let people say, Oh, look at him. He's a, he's, he's an idiot. Okay. Exactly. Big deal. Yeah. And I think you just made two main things that I want to expand on. The first thing that I'd like to expand on is the fact that, you know, when you're mentioning about talking about the person from uh, you know, broad view, you're also kind of talking about the holistic sense, right? It's like, What's going on at home, right? Because mm -hmm. if someone has a bad home life, it's hard to even process about, you know, their financial well-being or their mental health or how are they going to have a fantastic physical health if they're not able to get proper nutrition, you know? it's And I think a lot of people in society are just like, oh, you know, you're just bad at this. Oh, you know, you don't deserve this or you're not smart where they don't look at, you know, this person has grown up in poverty. They've Everyone moved. Deserves respect. Everyone deserves respect. Everyone. And, uh, you know, I think one thing that I wanted to pass on to the viewers is try not to judge people too fast. Cause even if they're giving you negative things, if they're making negative comments, you don't know what's going on in their life. And maybe it, they're in that third stage I was for the grief. You know, maybe they're in that anger stage and it's not even that it's necessarily directed to you, but there's just so much arousal in their body that they have to let it out. And I think if everyone just understood this, the world would be a better place because yeah. it's not personal. People are just going through things. And one of the main things that this uh, podcast is about, Brian, is kind of teaching people ways to cope with life properly, because ideally you wouldn't just, you know, rage at a random person or at a friend and do something that would hurt them. But, you know, with social media coming in, like people aren't having that connection and that interaction that you value and I value greatly. People just go on their social media, post pictures of themselves that are unrealistic to get likes, to impress people that don't know them or don't actually care for them. And they do that at the expense of their well-being, which is why I think mental health is decrease so much in society and also they do that at the expense of actual interactions with people that they love and you know dinner conversations that have just gone down parents teaching their kids about you know why alcohol is bad or why drugs are bad mm -hmm. and you know those decisions are obviously going to go down a huge thing but just sharing their own anecdotes their own stories their you know, their experiences, if their friends, you know, had a sad thing, and then they just hopped on to alcohol to numb up pain. Well, you know, and they tell the kids this, then they have that insight. And they're like, okay, mm -hmm. if I'm sad, maybe I can talk to a friend, because that's what my parents told me. And, you know, just sharing these experiences is vital. And, you know, just from this one episode, I mean, how much knowledge do we get so yeah. far, and we're not even close to being done, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So can I, can I answer you what I think uh, the answer yes, is? Yes. hundred percent. Purpose. Purpose. Go into that. Um, so again, my, my upbringing kind of pushed me into knowing myself, mm -hmm. uh, knowing why I do things, why my, my behaviors, my actions, my interactions, my reactions, those fast things that, oh shit, why did I do that? Th that yeah. kind of thing. Um, so when you're growing up through your teens, your twenties into your thirties, mm -hmm. you kind of flounder around a little bit. You're, you're, you're looking for something you're looking, you're looking, what you're looking for is purpose. Mm -hmm. 
when, when like, again, like you said, ah, I'm flipping through my, my Facebook, I'm doing, there's no purpose there. Yeah. Um, so what I mean by purpose, um, let me give you a little uh, anecdote first. Please. I have four cats. Beautiful. Cat dad. Um, one's neurotic. Yep. He was born that way. Yep. One is a, a, a love and whore. <laughs> Guess what? His purpose is he needs to love himself. Yeah. Because he's seeking that love and he eats so much food and he gets fat because of it. He needs to love himself. That's his purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I have another one that's um, thinks everything through. That mm-hmm. Everything is controlled. That there's no uh, autonomous in- instant reaction. It's all thought through. Right. He, he's, he has to learn how to let go a little bit. Uh, I have another one that no forethought whatsoever. Just yep. react. Always react. No, no thought. Guess what? He's got to learn. His purpose is to learn how to control. Yeah. If, if you can do that with people, you can find their purpose. You can tell them, if you have that purpose, all your other problems, they're not going to go away, but they're going to be manageable. So for myself, um, I was probably 32, 33, around there. Mm-hmm. Um, I found my purpose. My yeah. purpose is to help as many people as possible and in any way I can. It's part yeah. of what got me into teaching. Yeah. I have a direct effect on my neighborhood, my environment, which mm-hmm. is in the hundreds of thousands. And now I'm teaching other paramedics and nurses and doctors my way of viewing things in medicine. I'm reaching into the millions. You are. So that's purpose. Absolutely. That, that, that's what gives me drive. It's what gives me um, the patience to deal with uh, traffic in the morning. It's I get to focus on something. And, and purpose can change throughout your life. Mm-hmm. But you find what you're here for. All those cats, they were born that way. Yep. We're the same way. We're born this way. Find your purpose. You can find happiness. That's huge. And you, you hit a lot of interesting points. Um, you know, you're talking about purpose and it's interesting because I think when individuals don't know what they want to do with their life, there is a little bit of stress. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So the interesting thing about social media, it's not so much even that the fun that you're getting from it because it's, I mean, yeah, you, you might find a cute cat video once in a while, right? Um, maybe that's only 2001. I'm getting too old. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's a distraction from the pain and suffering. And I, I use those words, not that, you know, not having a purpose will literally deteriorate you, but it's very stressful on your body. And if you don't know what you're doing in life, I think that's the hardest part. And that's one of the hardest parts about being a young adult, you know, you don't know what you're doing in life. Your friends are going in different directions. Some people change, some people leave, some people come in, you know, it's really unknown. And the second point that I want to touch on, Brian, you know, you're, you're mentioning that you're teaching and you're teaching people, you're teaching doctors and your effect reach the millions. Now, the point that I just want to make here is interesting because a lot of people are saying, Oh, you know, if I don't do this one thing, you know, it won't make a big deal. It's just one action. But the thing that a lot of people miss is your one action impacts so many different people. That one compliment that you give someone when they may have had a terrible day at home, maybe the difference between life or death for him, which may be the dip, which may be the difference between, you know, like their family members becoming depressed, which may be the difference between them having a bad behavior on someone else. And the cycle goes on and, you know, it's, Oh, I just got chills from saying all this, (laughs) but you know, every single action you take in life has such a immense difference. You know, with Brian's case, teaching doctors to think in the system in in this uh, systematic way and seeing it from the top down, because they already know the details. So you paint the picture for them. You give them that canvas. They just go into it. They've studied for hours and hours, but but yeah. And you know, the, the framework that you give is vital. And these people now have that. They share that with their patient. They share that with their family. Their family shares it with other people. And yeah, you know, it just, guys, you know, try to do your best in life. And, you know, everyone will have bad days. Fair enough. 
and don't judge yourself for that because that's life. That's a process. Give yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive yourself. Huge. Um, and you know, if you have an ability to help someone, whether it's, you know, genuinely given a compliment, whether it's helping people even find certain places that they're looking for, Hey, do you know where the grocery store is? Oh, here, let me take you over. Makes a big difference. And some people will appreciate it and show you, but some people won't. And that's okay. Uh, because you've made a difference in their life and maybe not to them, but to others around. And hopefully it comes back to you. But if not, you made the world a better place. Yeah, man. Okay. That was a huge tangent, but you know, you just give such good That's anecdotes okay. to link these life lessons to. And I'm really happy to, you know, listen to this and make those connections. Hey, more connections, more people affected, more, more ripple effect. Huge, huge. So, uh, Brian, to be quite frank, I honestly forgot where we left off. Do you remember? Uh, let's see. I had, uh, <laughs> You know what? Let's go into COVID. Um, let's go into COVID. Yeah. Let's go into COVID. Uh, uh, hold on. Let let's get the oblig obligatory wow out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make this political. Yeah. I, I do have beliefs. I do know people uh, take them the wrong way. Yep. Um, I'm, so I want to try to stay polit apolitical if we can. For sure. Absolutely. So... <sighs> So I see patterns. That, that's what I see in life. Um, mm -hmm. I, I come in to uh, someone's house at the worst point of their life, literally, at the worst point of their life. And I direct the flow of the situation into a better place. Right. A better place medically, a better place mentally, spiritually, what, what, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so to do that, I have to know what's going on. I have to know what my environment shows me. So after 9-11, um, a, a lot of fear, mm. a lot of fear out there. I, one, one thing I told my mom recently is yeah. I, I was not raised for this world that we're in now. What do you mean by that? I was raised for the world pre-9-11. In what way? It's a completely different world. I, I can't even describe how different it is right now. It's night and day. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned some of it, the security, the, the, the governments, the, the wars, the, mm -hmm. that wasn't our, our future yeah. in, in 2000 at all. Our future was bright and oh my God, we're going to accomplish shit. Yeah. And, and it changed. Yeah. So that forced me to, to look at societal patterns. And I told you, I've been on the same unit for 20 years. Guess what? I study my society. I study yeah. my environment in depth. And what I noticed is, remember the uh, anthrax with the 9-11, 2002, uh, I think it went into 2003, maybe, I forget. So all that fear. Then we had, uh, what was it? SARS, MERS, uh, what else? H1N1, uh, um, Ebola. Yeah, uh, mad cow or whatever. Yeah, mad cow, uh, Crooksfield, uh, Jacob's disease. Uh, yeah. All things were, were coming through, guess what? They are seasonal. Yep. Every last one of them was seasonal. Hmm. Um, a couple of them, especially the one in 2004 ish, mm -hmm. it hit the medical community pretty hard. We, we had deaths like deaths that had no business dying. Right. Um, for example, we had a, a 27 year old uh, female EMT, no medical problems. She, she caught something, and then ended up, ended up dying. Um, her pattern of death matched other patterns of death. Interesting. So that's what I'm talking about patterns. You look for these patterns. Right. So if you see patterns of death, then you start asking around other paramedics uh, from different boroughs or from your borough. You say, hey, have you seen this? And they go, yeah, I've, seen, I've had a couple of those. So if he's had two, that means there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah. Um, so I started seeing these patterns that would come in in cycles along with the flu and there was morbidity, there was death and mm -hmm. people were getting hurt and it wasn't really reported that much. I mean, there was worry about it. There was talks about vaccinations. Uh, I think one vaccination came through and it, it, it folded because it, there was too many side effects. Yeah. Um, coming into COVID, I saw the same pattern. 
the same pattern that I'd witnessed again and again and again and again. Um, these, these kind of disease processes, what they do is they ramp up over time and then they ramp down over time. Mm -hmm. So if they're saying that they're, they, they started to see stuff in November, yeah. it was going around long before November because it takes time to ramp up. Oh, we spotted it in November. Here's, here's the peak way over here. And then it starts to go down in, what was it, uh, June of the following year? Yeah. May, May, June, something like that was when uh, it ended in my area in the Northeast. Um, so I watched COVID come in. I, I watched the waves of it come in um, from, from China, uh, across Europe, Italy, France, uh, yeah. Europe, and then into America. And it hit New York City in America first really hard. Yeah. Uh, and again, I witnessed it come in. I saw the communities that brought it into the city and spread it around. And then we spread it around as medical professionals because yeah. Hey, people are getting sick. People are coughing. Oh yeah, bad, bad, bad cold season. Yeah. Um, and then just one day out of the blue, they said, "Okay, everything shut down." That was the first or second week of March. Yeah. And COVID was again. I, I mentioned that it was the first time I'd experienced stuff since nine eleven, like that. Yeah. It, it changed society. COVID has changed the world, just like 9-11 has changed the world. Yeah. So politics, what, I, I don't care what your politics is, it's changed the world. Yeah. What it did for EMS was, hmm, police department runs security. If yep. something bad happens on a scene, police run the streets. Fire runs safety. If something yep. bad happens, an explosion, a collapsed building, they run the streets. Yep. EMS ran the streets of New York City for five weeks. We ruled. We, we told people where to do, what to do, where to go, how to go, when to do it. And it was an, a very scary experience. Yeah. We were not working within protocol. We were yep. working within, this is serious. Yep. You got to watch out. Um, Got to protect yourself as best as you can, and you have to protect your public too. Absolutely. So what we as a group, as EMS in a group, I can only speak for myself uh, in, in, in my borough, Staten Island. Yep. Uh, but I do see how other people act and other medics and EMTs across the United States. We, we told people to stay at home. Yep. Oh, but I'm sick. I have chest pain. I have this. What if I'm having a heart attack? Stay home. Yeah. And the ERs were empty. They were bare because no one would go to the ERs. Right. So it kind of pushed people into learning how to take care of themselves. Right. Because when, when I grew up, you had 102 fever. Your, your mom took off your, your shirt and made you freeze, made sure you didn't shiver too much, uh, maybe gave you some aspirin or Tylenol, mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you sweated it out for a day or two. You didn't go to the emergency room. Why? And nowadays, everyone goes to the emergency. Oh, I stubbed my toe. Let's go to the emergency room. So yeah. I think, I think the, the part of what COVID has helped with is giving people a little bit more independence when it comes to their, their well-being. Don't focus on this so much. Yeah. Focus more on how you feel. Know yeah. yourself. Know your reactions. Know that when you're coughing up a lung and, and it's wet and gooky, Guess what? You have to get that stuff out. You can't leave it down there. Mm -hmm. If you leave it down there, it's going to turn into pneumonia. That's just common sense. Mm -hmm. But you tell people that, oh, you're, you're, you're a medical person. That's not common sense. If you pay attention, it is. It's yeah. common sense. Absolutely. So COVID has its pluses and its negatives. Um, Absolutely. Just uh, one second before yeah. we, we, we go on, Brian. So you, there's... A lot of knowledge that you're spewing here. And I have a couple questions, you know, as a teacher that you are, not only in your profession, but more so even in life, I'd say, you know, you're mentioning that you see common trends, common activities that come up during, for example, SARS or mad cow, things of this nature that don't necessarily get to the mainstream media kind of before it's too late. Now, one of the things that I was kind of just thinking about in the back of my mind while you mentioned this was 
why isn't there some sort of app for or app or reporting system that medical professionals can list these odd circumstances that are really against the norm, you know? There, there's no, there's no common structure. Mm. Uh, there's common structure in uh, nursing school that we teach all the nurses the same, all the doctors the same. Uh, there's common structure in a, uh, a group of hospitals. And then you have a bunch of smaller hospitals. So there, there's no way to be able to show people the best way. It's mm. trial and error. Absolutely. So one, one of the first lessons that we learned, and we heard it coming across from Europe, is that don't intubate people. You intubate someone, they're going to die. Yep. And that's a pretty standard statistic. So guess what we had to do? We had to learn to find a better way uh, and not intubate. Uh, CPAP, th those hoods that you saw, the, the, the respiratory hoods from Europe. Yeah. Um, you found uh, drug treatments anything that you could find that would allow you to avoid that. Yeah. Well, why couldn't we just learn the lesson from people in Europe? Politics, politics just destroyed it. It took yeah. it one way and it took it another, and I'm sure it was somewhere in the middle, but there's no way to, to communicate that information to other professionals. Yeah. And you know, that's, it's, it's just such a sad thing. You know, we, one thing that I'm kind of a little bit disheartened about, you know, there's individuals in life who are, just privileged just by the way place that they were born, the place that they are have opportunities to live. You know, me and you, Brian, we're in North America. We have a lot of privileges that other people would only dream about. The freedom to, you know, say what we think is one of them, right? Which is something that we take for granted on a daily basis. But, you know, there's, I'm not sure if the politics of this works, but if there is anyone listening who does have a coding background or wants to form some sort of coalition to develop an open source platform where medical professionals could all share this insight in a secure path with, with, you know, inter, uh, international, uh, collaboration. That would be huge. That would save lives. And, you know, it's, it's important to, you know, be prideful of one's nation, but at the same time, it's important to realize that we're all humans, you know, we all deserve access to the best care. And you'd think at a time where, me and you are having a conversation, you know, across from West to East, you know, we could share this information like this and we should, you know, if there are individuals who have had experience like you and they're noticing, wow, there's a much higher number of individuals who are coughing at this time. Well, if other people are doing that and all that's posted, how much faster would this have been stopped? You know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. And this could be just even the first phase where they're like, okay, wow, we have like 500 cases of this. Last year we had 20. Maybe we should investigate it further. Do some more tests, stop it before it becomes, you know, more serious and lockdowns have to come in. People have more morbidities. And um, yeah, I think that's one thing that's really important. And, you know, just intubation and the death rate. I mean, something as simple as that if that can't be communicated after like a month, because I think from Europe to America, it took around a month to yeah. came. Yeah. And the internet's like this. Why can't we have that? You know, that's something that I hope we can make in the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, Brian, I mean, one other thing that I wanted to ask you, actually. So one thing that people don't realize, well, I thought that people didn't really appreciate is, you know, a lot of us go through COVID, financial struggles, mental health struggles, and for some of us, physical and even mortality of either our family or friends, someone we know, someone we heard of on the news. Paramedics, doctors, nurses, and you know, that was a bit unfair of me. I think a lot of people do realize the service that you all give. And, but how are you feeling? You know, like, because, you know, I know you have an innate calling to service, but this is, a virus that hasn't hit our world ever since I think it was the Spanish flu or, you know, what was your feeling? What was going on to your head? You hit March, you're like, lockdowns are happening and I'm going up, talking to people, directing people. I have to deal with people, transporting them in the worst cases in New York City, which is one of the worst hit parts in North America. 
So yeah, drive us through that experience. I had the same, I had the same experience I had with 9-11. I was frustrated. Frustrated. Um, I could see, again, I look at the big picture. Mm-hmm. And seeing the big picture, you know what kind of response needs to be taken. And when you don't see it taken, it's frustrating. Yeah. So you, you kind of feel that you have to at least take charge of your little area, your little environment, and educate people in your environment. So at least they, they feel safe. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was most of uh, COVID. The, the, the six weeks that it was really hitting hard in my area was frustration because I, I couldn't I couldn't teach patients as well because there wasn't as much interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't teaching students because I had no classes at the time. I was just my 911 uh, uh, position. Uh, so what ended up happening is it led into now I try to get the message out. Big picture, big understanding. Yes, this is real. Yes, it's serious. Mm-hmm. But it's not as bad as, oh, my God, I have to lock myself in forever and, and not have no interactions. Yeah, there's things you have to do. There's steps that you have to take. But take them. You'll be fine. And we'll get through it. Uh, I, guess, I guess what I'm talking about, for example, is my son. Yep. Terrified, terrified, terrified. He has a, uh, a companion that uh, is borderline immunocompromised. Yep. So he was terrified for her, too, understandably. 100%. But with my understanding of, of the, the COVID and the process, mm-hmm. I could tell him, look, it's, it's not going to be a big deal for you, more than likely. You really don't have to worry. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you have a good diet. You have, you're fairly healthy, and so is she. I mean, you're young. Uh, you, you don't have diabetes. You don't have the... Guess what? They both got COVID, and now they're fine. Right. They, they, they are still concerned. Yes, I have to wear my mask. Yes, I have to do this. But their outlook has changed for them i wish i could pass that on to more people covid scary be careful protect yourself but don't overdo it Mm -hmm. yeah and uh just uh one point that i think i'd like to make too is you know a lot of young people are and kind of counter your point so respectfully um but you know a lot of young people are saying that you know it doesn't affect me it doesn't kill me it uh doesn't you know really change my life and it only affects older people. So like, why should I waste my youth and all this? But, you know, I've noticed, I actually made a interesting post on Reddit and I, it got viral. And I asked individuals, individuals with COVID, what is the one thing you wish you knew about the process? And I got a lot of answers, but what it mainly focused on Brian was, you know, the morbidity associated with COVID. You know, because a lot of people just think it's life and death. And the one thing that is beyond me, I don't understand why the mainstream media doesn't talk about the fact that, you know, you could be tired for four weeks after this and you could have brain damage from it, you know, depending on the procedures that you go through. You could really be hiking 24-7 right before this, grab this, and depending on the viral load you get and your genetic, because differs for every single person, you know, your life will maybe never be the same, regardless if you're 20, you won't die, but your quality of life will be diminished. You'll get tired more easily. You know, you won't be able to do the same things that you like doing. So, you know, it's, it's something that is really weird. And I wish this aspect got talked about more and granted, yeah, hundred percent agreed. The younger demographic, the death rate is low, statistically speaking. And that's why, you know, you see like 30,000 cases, 10 deaths, or probably even less than that, right? I just threw that number out there randomly. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's something that uh, I wish just got talked about a bit more. But, yeah, you're right. You know, it's a lot of fear has gone into this as well, which is affecting the mental health. And, you know, I think if we keep going down this hole, we're going to get into politics. I, I, blame, I blame media on that. Yeah. That's not politics. Yeah. Honestly, that's not politics. Yeah. Media has put a lot of attention into this and their 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 main line is profit. Hmm. And it and selling commercial. Right. And selling fear. That's their main line. So 
they got a lot of attention. They got a lot of profit. Yep. Stop scaring people. Yes, it's scary enough. Yes, yes, there's absolutely things you need to be doing. Yep. That being said, <clears throat> the drive behind the mental craziness, I feel, is the mainstream media. I agree. I agree. And I mean, disgusting. that's disgusting. I hate that. Yep. And I think just uh, giving an anecdote to support your point there, Brian, you know, when the March hit, lockdowns happened and all that kind of jazz, you know, I was watching the news for like four or five hours a day and didn't feel too good, you know, tired, you know, sad, you know, all this kind of feeling. And it was probably just from that, all the fear, all the message and not to say that, you know, you should just go out without a mask and just like start hugging every single person that you see on the street. But, you know, like just by consuming all that media, you're scared, you know, take your precautions in life, but don't, you know, just shack yourself up in the house, you know, go for walks, try to keep your distance with people and do the best that you can. And, you know, by wearing a mask, by keeping your distance, you're going to decrease your odds as much as you can. But at the end of the day, you can't, you know, stop living. Um, was I wanted to ask you one other question regarding this. This was a question. Boom. So in the medical community and science community and kind of just, you know, academia in general, there is a general consensus that if you do not have the right authority, you shouldn't speak on this matter. And this is going to go into a very interesting question that is kind of not with mainstream media, but even well, a little bit possibly mainstream media, but more like YouTube, podcasters, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we as, as individuals who are in the medical profession right now, I'm a kinesiologist, I'm working on rehabilitation, and I'm kind of hoping to get into medicine. And that's kind of my vision forward. But we've oftentimes been told that, you know, if you do not have that training, if you do not have that, you know, level of certification, you shouldn't speak on the matter. Now, the point that I'm making, and the reason I'm asking about this, and because a lot of media now, YouTube, podcasting, they bring on guests and they talk about things such as, you know, drugs or medication or, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, obviously they don't have the background in that as well to be even talking about this, which can influence someone from taking, you know, I don't know, drugs, which can influence people from taking different lifestyle approaches. Do you think that as medical professionals or individuals who are in the you know, realm of helping individuals with their health and have some background in it from the physiology to, you know, the experience. Do you think that we should be limited by that or we should just give a disclosure and then give our opinion? Huge question. So mm. take your time. That, that's, that's a dangerous path to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start, start limiting people's ability to communicate mm -hmm. in any fashion, that, that's a bad path. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, hmm. it's a huge question. The, 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 Cause I've thought about this on occasion, Yeah. Uh, but the only even remote way of dealing with it that I've come up with is what, what's the benefit to the speaker? Mm. What's the benefit to the teacher? What's the benefit to the guide or the expert? or the consult. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for a, a meditation teacher, yep. would you go to the one that you're gonna pay $200 an hour for? Or would you go to the one that says, I've been doing this for 20 or 30 years, I wanna help you. So what's the benefit? That's yeah. what I would say. When it comes to medical people's opinion, credentials means a lot. It yep. does. At the same time, there has to be room for experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know many people that have experience that I do. Yep. E even in my field, even as a paramedic, I don't know many people like me that have my experience, as yep. much experience as I do. I'm, I don't have credentials. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a paramedic, big whoop. I have a few other credentials here and there and some teaching licenses, but big whoop. I don't mm -hmm. have a bachelor's. I don't have a master's. I got nothing. So who am I? I'm nobody. But guess what? I teach doctors and nurses for a reason. I'm really good at it. Yeah. So there needs to be some room for that as well as the credentialed. The problem is 
filtering out each. You got bullshit credentials. You got bullshit uh, people that that speak about stuff they don't know nothing about. So huge. Yeah. The, the only way I could think of is what are they getting out of it? Absolutely. And you know, like kind of just bringing it back to your previous point, there are a lot of people who have the credentials, but they're unable to make that big picture synthesis. Yet yeah. they're giving this advice out because they have that credential, that check mark. Where mm-hmm. Other individuals may be able to better speak on this, but because they don't have that checkbox, they're unable to give this experience. And I think the other thing that I just kind of wanted to touch upon, you know, there's just so many other people talking about medicine, whether it's taking drugs, doing Mm -hmm. certain activities, smoking, drinking, X, Y, Z. And by limiting the medical professional that actually has at least a little bit more insight on these topics, you know, it's, it's hard because obviously you want the right information to come across, but I think as long, I think there should be some sort of change where you could at least give a disclosure and then state your opinion. And that should be accepted because we have way less people in this field, but if we were able to do that, at least the message would come across a little bit more and more Mm -hmm. people can adopt safer habits. More people can have more insight and, you know, just giving the experiences that you've shared, you know, a little bit more, understanding from individuals who don't have this and then maybe they could share it and make that network effect we're talking about mm-hmm. yeah very much yeah so brian again long tangent but you know a lot of connections we're making you know we're using that same style of teaching that you and i both like it's okay yeah so take us through uh, a little bit more of this you know you're talking about the fact that uh you know italy's had this we're not able to use the same information and you know, you're kind of going through this, you're a little bit stressed because there's nothing to do because you're telling everyone to stay at home. And yeah, what, what's up next with this? Uh, hmm. So let, let me tell you a couple of stories from COVID sure. uh, that kind of sent things home for me. And then, and then I'll move on post COVID now into returning to COVID now. Yeah. yeah. Um, first week in March, I, uh, I had a cardiac arrest. Wow. Um, I have them all the time. Uh, That was my second one that day. So, I mean, first one was a COVID patient, cardiac arrest. We worked them up, pronounced, went about our business, cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Second one was another cardiac arrest. 52-year-old guy. uh, He had uh, been confirmed having COVID. He'd fallen uh, the previous night. He got up, back up into the bed, and the wife found him dead on the floor in the morning. Wow. So, we worked him up. Uh, we ended up pronouncing and, uh, I, I hate to say this. I'm actually pretty proud of telling, uh, how well I'm at telling people that their loved one has died. I'm really mm. good at it. It's I, an important I feel skill. It's a duty and an honor to be able to do that because you have to have some segue for your grief into acceptance and death. Yep. Um, so I started my spiel. With, yep. with the wife, I'm very sorry. We did everything the emergency room uh, would have done. Um, he, he, he just didn't make it. Uh, your, your, your husband is dead. I'm sorry. And she started crying and her daughter was right there. And she says, oh my God, oh my God, him too. And I'm like, and then she, she looks at me and she says, oh, my grandfather died of COVID last week. Same house. Wow. So two COVID deaths in the same house within a week. That, I started tearing up. I, I don't tear up for nothing. You know what I mean? I've seen it all, done it all. And I started tearing up and I was like, Oh, oh I'm very sorry. Bye. <laughs> and, and I ran out to my ambulance to hide. Uh, but that's when I realized what this was about. That's when I realized, yeah, this is some serious stuff going on that we have to be careful of. And that really pushed my, my education direction when it, mm. when it re- relates to COVID. Um, so whenever I have patient contact, mm-hmm. I'll tell them what I think. If you ask me what, what's this, what's that, what do you think about I will tell you what I think yeah. within the confines of my medical profession. Yeah. Um, what it means going into COVID now is I can prepare my, my neighborhood for it. That's what it means. For the last two months, because again, I saw, you, you could see it coming back. You can see the closures and, and, and things yeah. ramping up and, oh, we have a thousand patients a day. Oh, now we have 1,200 patients a day. You, you can see things. Yeah. Um, so I've been for the last two months preparing my neighborhood. Yeah. 
educating people, telling them, you, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to focus on this. Oh, well, but what should I go to the hospital? In this case, I'd recommend waiting versus, look, you really need to go. Oh, but COVID will kill me. I really think you need to go. Let, let's get you to the hospital and get you yeah. checked out. Don't worry about the COVID. We got to focus on you right now. Um, so that's what I've been doing for the last two months. Yeah. Uh, I know it's coming back. I do not have a lot of faith in a vaccine. Mm. Um, I have faith in people. Yeah. I have faith in this will die out or go into the background yeah. sooner than later. Uh, they're thinking, what, what was it, 2021, end of 2021? All right. We've been doing this for almost a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. To, to be fair on the vaccine front, I think this is one of the fastest developed vaccines in a while. Interesting. And yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a novel virus. There's no like background to work with. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a worldwide effort and your, your point on the belief in people, I think that's very important. You know, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, what's that, uh, saying? So when uh, carbon, the pencil, right? When you write mm -hmm. with a pencil, the graphite that it uses for the, to write, that's carbon. And interestingly enough, that same thing, I'm not sure if it could be from the pencil. That was just an example of a carbon source, but under pressure, mm -hmm. carbon turns into diamond, mm -hmm. right? And similarly, so in tough circumstances, eventually we harden and we turn into something beautiful. And I think that metaphor can be used for society because we're all experiencing a lot of hardship through this and everyone has different levels of it, different, you know, streams of it. And I don't think two individuals will be affected to the same degree, but you know, this is something that we're all put into, whether we like it or not. And I think the belief in society that we will come together, regardless of politics, regardless of anything, you know, like we, we were talking about with our whole conversation, this is something that is to the same magnitude as 9-11, you know, and we have to come together. We have to come together. We have to work together, regardless if you're right, left, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 you know, we're all people, we're all going through this and we want to, you know, make the best of it for everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Brian, I think, uh, let's go through one more story and then kind of wrap it up because we're going a little bit long, but you know, I, I love this. Uh, let's see. Um, Browse the library. <laughs> okay. I got a story for you. Yeah. Uh, not that, no, not that different. One. All right. So after 9-11, uh, um, there was an airplane crash in Far Rockaway. Yep. I believe it was uh, October. I, I forget the exact date. I responded to that. Yep. Uh, helpless again. Yeah. Everyone said. Uh, yep. We ended up doing uh, body transport, cadaver transports. Yeah. Uh, we put them in body bags. We load them up in the ambulance and we take them over to Floyd Bennett Field. So what I'd like to share specifically about this incident is I'm going over the, uh, the, the bridge from uh, Far Rockaway and um, they're doing construction at the time. Yep. And I, I bumped one of those little dividers that you're not supposed to bump into and, and it jostled. And for some reason, I looked down and back, I was driving, I looked down and back and at that exact moment, I saw a wave of blood come over the lip between the back compartment and the front compartment and just cover the bottom of my front compartment. Oh my God. So my point is what we as humans tend to do is put all of our grief, all of our fear, all of our negative emotions into visual sights. And that sight that I had represented the entire job. So yeah. whenever I think of that job or whenever I, I have a flashback, you know, they talk about army guys have flashbacks. Yeah. Whenever I have a flashback, it's of that seeing the blood go over the lip. But yeah. you know what? I know it's actually all the fear and everything behind it is what's behind that memory. So a number of years later, I had this um, uh, police officer who had just retired. He right. was 54, 55. He'd been retired for six months. He was having chest pain. Mm-hmm. He said, yeah, I retired and just my health went down and everything went down. And 
And he said, you, you look like a, a, a guy that's been doing this for a while. I want to give you some advice. He said that us as professionals, PD, EMS, fire, nursing, doctors, the, these public health, the things that we see, they affect us. Yeah. So what that means is we always have our guard up. Always. Yeah. You go to work, you have your guard up. You come home, guess what? You still have your guard up because you can't let that stuff in. So you end yeah. up having fights with your family or, or you, you, you do stupid shit or you drink yeah. too much or whatever. Yeah. So his point was, don't let those memories, like my memory of the blood flow, don't let it drag you down. Because when you retire, your guard is going to come down Right. And all those memories are going to come flooding back and they are going to screw with you medically, psychologically, mentally, spiritually. You need to deal with it beforehand. Yeah. That's what 9-11 taught me. That's what COVID has taught me. You must deal with your shit. Absolutely. You can't bury it. You have to process it. And the okay. way you do that is to know yourself. Yep. Know your purpose. Yep. And be okay with your actions. Yeah. To forgive yourself and, and to move forward and be confident. Absolutely. And, you know, that kind of hits back to the point, you know, try to embrace your purpose. Yeah. Don't distract yourself from it on social media. And, you know, if you think you need therapy or if you don't have individuals to help you through this, finding your purpose or finding how to cope with this, feel free to get it, you know, and, you know, it's, it's okay. Everyone goes through life and I think therapy is very beneficial for it's most people, if not everyone. Yeah. So... Yeah, you definitely got to start somewhere, but the processing element is huge. And as soon as you are able to, you know, actually process that and go through it, the better, because if you don't, you know, you got one pile, 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 pile. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, it's like a Jenga tower slamming down. Wow, mm -hmm. that was such a lame analogy. I love it. That's all right. It works. <laughs> um, we, we dived into so many awesome topics. We got so much yeah. value. The connections really we good. made, Thank we you. made, yeah, likewise, you know, the connections we made as a team were just fantastic. So I guess, you know, there's one opportunity right now where you can give your one message to the viewers on whatever you like to do. What would you like to say? I'd like to question. stress my know yourself, know yeah. thyself. Yeah. Too many people are focused outward outward into electronics, into news, into media, into family, into friends. They don't look inside themselves. So you go into the shower and then you think and you drive yourself crazy because that's the only time you have to think. Slow down, take it easy, go out into nature here and there. Yep. You know yourself. You'll find your purpose. You'll find happiness. Trust me. That's huge. So, uh, what about, you know, contacting you or reaching you or anything like that? Do you have any shout outs you want to give anything like that? Uh, yeah, I'd like to, to shout out to uh, my, my fellow EMS workers here in the, in the city. We're, we're all really doing a good job. Um, it, it's, it's been a rough year. It has. Yep. Uh, one thing that I didn't touch on too much is we do get some recognition. Yep. But guess what? It goes away after the disaster goes away. Yep. After 9-11 yep. went away, EMS, poof, no one yep. thought about them anymore. Yep. COVID, same thing. We're here. We're here for you. Yeah. So props, props. I, I work with a company of heroes. You do. You do. And you're a hero yourself. And I think with that, sir, thank you for your service. Thank you for everyone who is, you know, helping us through this pandemic, for putting yourself on the line for others and, you know, changing this world for the good of everyone else. And uh, with that said, that is another episode of the Personal Process Podcast. And thank you again for viewing. Wonderful. Cheers, guys. Hey, everyone. Par, I'm back after another amazing episode with another amazing guest. We hope we added value into your life so you could take the tips from this episode and fuel your process forward. If you enjoyed our episode today and think other friends or family members may also appreciate the lessons that our podcast brings, be sure to share us with them. Subscribe and rate our show so we know how we did. And always remember, trust the process.